what do you need to know about the first Chronicles? Well, there's a lot of things. Um, just like the Gospels, there's many. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. First Chronicles also has not, obviously, Gospels, but there are other books that repeat the story that First Chronicles is telling you. First Chronicles tells you the story of Saul and David. And obviously, uh, Second Samuel tells you about the story of David. And First Kings tells you the story of uh, King David as well. They tell you from different perspectives. We don't know who wrote First Chronicles. Um, we believe maybe it was Ezra, but we are not sure um, of who, because there's not enough evidence to pinpoint to one person. Why, what, what we do know is that the author of First Chronicles had one goal in mind, to acknowledge how God saw David, the importance of David's role, and the goodness of David, and why God chose him to be the king of Israel over Saul. And obviously, because of that perspective, in First Chronicles, it's omitted the story of Uriah and Bathsheba. Why? Because the goal of First Chronicles is telling you not of the humanity of David, but tell you as to why God, what did God see in David? And so the story develops as I'm going to read it today. Also know this important fact about what I'm going to read. This is the prayer of thanksgiving of David. Do you want to be practicing thanksgiving, a prayer? Pay attention how David prays. Just like Jesus taught us to pray uh, with the Lord's Prayer, David is also teaching us to pray with these verses that I will read now. The timing of the prayer of David comes handy, especially because this is after he receives the news that not him, but his son will be in charge of building the house of God, the temple. David is to work and to gather resources and this and that, but the benefit of the house of God is not for him. In fact, he's not going to see it. The children, the generations that come after that will be the ones that will enjoy of the benefit of the house of the God, the, the place of worship. Much like why we need to fix and raise the roof, which is the name of the campaign that we are going to do for the sanctuary, is the same reason. We don't do, we are not supposed to replace the roof of the sanctuary for our own sake, but for the sake of the generations that will come through those doors after we have gone. I don't, cannot tell you how much is going to be. I can tell you that we can put resources together, and by the grace of God, it will come all together. And that's the story of the music of this summer. Song after song, if you pay attention to the author, is regular people living their lives. Something happened that produced this wonderful testimony in adoration to God. It's a little bit different than what it is now. A lot of the music that is being produced now happens from people who are musicians by profession, and that is their, basically their job. And not to minimize their efforts, is that used to be different. Amazing Grace today comes from a guy, Newton. He was a slave trader at that moment. He has this message. He changes his ways becomes a minister, writes the song, and it doesn't become as popular until later, much on. And these are the hidden stories of the hymns that we are paying attention to. That's why we wanted to do this sermon series, and why Doris has required so much um, work, is because we are digging down into the essence of these stories. Why? Because they have powerful testimonies for us. Because we wish to amplify God's eternal melody. Amazing grace. For the last two weeks, I've been thinking a lot about grace. You know, for the first week, we, we stay in Orlando in one of the hotels, and we went to the pool and this and that. And I've been thinking about grace. 
Why? Because I'm going to go on vacation to rest with a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. There's no rest. Do you see how tan I am? Yeah, it was wake up before sunrise. And, 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 and you know, my children are used to living in a, in a house that has their room. And so when they are tired, meaning when we are tired, they go to their room and they sleep and we close the door. But when you're in a hotel, you can't do that. You have to be with them. And so when everybody takes a nap, guess what? Everything is quiet because we need that. And I've been thinking about grace because often, my gosh, the energy, the input that they take is a lot. And so I've been thinking about grace, and there was a moment, and we were in South Carolina, and we were in this very small room, and they are in the bed, and I'm typing away, and I just look at my children, and I started thinking, who am I that deserves such a blessing? Not the quiet, but I look at them as they are sleeping. And I look on the other side, and that is my wonderful, talented partner, my wife, Mel. Who am I that deserves such a blessing to be in this place and this time with such a peace? You know, and this is the problem with grace for Christians right now. As Christians, we have normalized grace. We come to expect it. We don't pay attention to the significance of those small moments. We want more and more and more, which is why we're going to talk about sweet. How sweet this sound that's safe. Think about amazing grace like watermelon in the middle of the summer after you take it from the fridge. Have you ever eaten that? It's one of my favorite things. When it's, it's gotten square and you take it from the fridge and it's so cold, there is not an amount of water or beer or whatever your favorite drink is that will be as sweet as watermelon coming from that. Now imagine that and imagine you add a tablespoonful of sugar to watermelon. And that's what we do with grace. Grace by itself is like that beautiful watermelon already sliced and stored and safe for us. And what do we do? We like adding stuff. In fact, we get upset when we open the fridge and there is no watermelon. That's what we do as Christians. We love to sing, how sweet the sound that's safe. And what do we forget? The part that says, a wretch like me. David says this in verse 16, says, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? David is overwhelmed. David is overwhelmed by the promises and the faithfulness of God that he can open the fridge and see the watermelon and that you don't have to add sugar you don't even have to cut it. You don't even have to learn how to cut a watermelon because I know some of you don't even know how to cut a watermelon. And if you try, you're going to cut yourself. So be careful. That was a bad joke, huh? Nobody laughed? Hmm. Okay. Getting rusty here after two weeks. But, but really, David is overwhelmed that every single time that he opens the fridge, there is watermelon the sweet watermelon, the sweet grace for him, the promises and the fulfillment of that faithfulness. So David's heart is filled with gratitude at this moment of the prayer of First Chronicles. And he reflects in the ways that God has blessed him, and not only him, but his lineage. I was at that moment when I was looking at my boys. Who am I? that deserves such a blessing? Who am I to say that I can be the father of Nico and Dante? I don't know what they're going to accomplish, but if I believe in that watermelon, in that grace, I'm going to open it, and I'm going to say, wow, you are going to accomplish great things, far more than I've ever accomplished. David recognizes that he's not by his own merit. 
It is not by my merit that I deserve such a grace. Grace, after all, is favor from God that is not earned. It's undeserved favor from God. My friends, If we're going to talk about grace, the first thing that you have to recognize is that we minimize the importance. We come to think that we deserve the watermelon, even though it is safe for us. It's a bit complicated, but not really. When you think about it, do you give thanks for such a thing as a watermelon after it comes out and before you eat it? It's a blessing, and we tend to minimize it as Christians. It is time for us as Christians to be more like David, to know that we don't deserve it, and yet it is reserved for us. David's response serves as a beautiful example of humility and thanksgiving. Take the example of David. You don't have to be perfect, but if there is anything that David did right, was to recognize the presence of God in his life. And that's what you have to do. That's what I'm inviting you to do today. That as you on Tuesday open, because I know that most of us are going to eat watermelon on Independence Day. May you think about grace on that day. You remember, you don't have to add sugar. My friends, it's sweet enough for even wretch like us. Let us be grateful for the blessings that we have already received. Pay attention to how sweet the grace of God is. What more can I say to you about the way that you have honored me, says David. You know what your servant is really like. He wrote this after everything has happened with Uriah, who he got killed in the the battlefield, and Bathsheba. Do you think that David simply overcame his fillness of loss, which was the biggest giant that he had to defeat? Do you think that he just says, oh, I did it one time and I'm just going to be done? No, he probably, David probably, as a man that he is, probably struggled with that all his life. So when he says, you know what your servant is really like, you know that David was constantly trying to overcome his sinful nature. It was not a done deal. David was always pushing. And David is like, my gosh, you have honored me with such a graceful life. I don't deserve it, especially because I know you know me. I don't know if you follow me on social media on the new page that I wrote it. I, I created a, 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 a Facebook page that is called Pastor Mario, where I'm just using it as an outlet of information. During vacation, I wrote more than normally I do. I wrote probably eight to ten articles in a span of two weeks. Why? Because I was recognizing this grace, and I could not help but think about things to write about. see me in that position with such a privilege, what else can I do? Do I really deserve this? And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm trying to put things into perspective here. I want to put everything on the table for you to know that you have been honored with grace. So what would you do with such a grace? You know who Fred Rogers is? Is the guy on your bulletin. Now, did you know that he was a, a reverend, a minister, a Presbyterian minister? And he is quoted saying this, human beings are not born with self-control. We have to learn what to do with it. And the original quote says mad, but I want to put whatever we feel. Learning to control ourselves is a long, hard process. It happens little by little. In fact, it is something we work on all through our lives. Fred Rogers, Pastor Fred Rogers, is talking about us, you and me. He's talking about every human being, and he's talking about King David. King David had to learn to have self-control. Why? Because don't 
forget how power corrupts. So it was easy for David to say, well, I'm king. I can take whatever I want. I was chosen, anointed by God, so I can do whatever I want. Is that true? No, it is not. So my friends, what Fred is saying is we are not born with self-control. So when we receive grace and we see how sweet it is, we want to add sugar. But when you add sugar, what happens is no longer grace. It's something else. So we have a different perspective. We can gain a different perspective. There's another part of the song that says, I was blind, but now I see. Sometimes as Christians, we want to pay attention to grace like this. And we say, I don't see it. I hear about it. I know about it. People are telling me about grace, but I don't see it. Do you know why sometimes you don't see it? Because sometimes you need to open your eyes. It's like this, for example. Sometimes grace is like this. And you don't see it. And what it takes is for you to shift your perspective. Sometimes we say, I don't see the grace of God. And that's because you have to move from where you are. It's like when you're watching a movie and it's somebody in front of you. And the person in front of you doesn't let you see it. So you're just going to stay there. Or you're going to just shift a little bit and say, oh, now I see. I was blind, but now I see. Because we have that ability. God has given us the ability for us to grow. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of what? Power, love, self-control. That's a different version, but equally important. Power. Love and self-control. Self-control is the thing that allows you to say, you know what? Mm, oh, now I see. And sometimes people and grace go like this. So Newton was a bad guy. We can judge him, right? Sadly, we shouldn't, but we do. Pay attention to what... Um, Acts 10, hold on, I'm going off script a little bit here. Acts 10, 28. Peter told him, you know it is against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. He's talking about uh, immigrants or people who are not Jewish. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Did you know that the Bible says that? For those who says, ah, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says here in verse 28 of Acts 10 that you should not longer think or believe of anyone as impure or unclean. Take that for what it's worth. John Newton was a slave trader who almost died, recognizes his sinful ways, was blind, but now he sees, becomes a minister, and encourages people. So sometimes you can go from bad to good. Praise be the grace of God. But sometimes, and more often than not, especially because I know you all, all of you are wonderful, talented God-fearing children who wish to be disciples of God. I praise God for all that because none of you are bad. None of you are the John Newton. Most of you are like Fred Rogers, a minister, a pastor of a congregation. He was good. But guess what? By grace, he was better because Fred Rogers discovered that in television, there was no soul. And so he took it upon himself to create this program to give hope to a future for children. 
he decided to invest. He walked away from the church, not because it was bad, but because he had a more purposeful path that he could walk. So in my, in my imitation is that you can go from bad to good, but you can go from good to better. Did you know that? By the grace of God, you can go from good to better. Because you're not called to be an enforcer of rules, but an outpost, outpost of amazing grace. An amazing grace that allowed a wretched man to be a good man and a good man to become an even better man. Now, if you want to stop minimizing or normalizing grace, here's the thing that David teaches us today. David doesn't say king. David doesn't say warrior. David says what? Servant. And now, O oh Lord, I am your servant. And that's what I realized in South Carolina when I saw... Nico and Dante and my, and my partner, my wife, just there. What am I going to do with all this amazing grace? Oh, I know. I am going to recommit myself as a servant of God to do the very thing that I am doing right now, but better. So who is with me? Who wants to not simply be good, but better? Stop normalizing amazing grace. Stop adding sugar to the watermelon. Recognize how sweet it is. Even though we are wretched people, wretched people, God reserves that wonderful faith, that wonderful gift, that amazing grace for us. Amen.